Okay, hello everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for June 6th. Uh, this is the time of the week where we get together to go over and talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Tim and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. Uh, CircuitPython is a version of Python that's designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. The CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically occurs on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern time, 11 a.m. Pacific time, except when that coincides with a U.S. holiday. Uh, in the notes doc, there is a link to a calendar that you can view online or your favorite calendar app. We'll also send notifications about the upcoming meetings via Discord. So if you'd like to receive those notifications, then you can ask to be added to that CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes document to accompany the meeting. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video. Uh, so, use, uh, so you can use the document to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so this gives you an option to skip around uh, if you're watching after the fact on YouTube. Um, after each meeting, we post a link to the next meeting's notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to always find the latest notes document uh, so you can add your notes for the following meeting. And you can find that throughout the week as well, so feel free to fill in your notes uh, even before Mondays if you would like. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, uh, you can leave hug reports or status updates in the document and we will read them uh, during the meeting once we get to you in the list. Uh, this meeting will be held in five parts. The first part is going to be community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of the Python on microcontrollers newsletters, uh, which comes out on Tuesdays. The second part uh, will be the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we are all individually working on. Uh, the third part is hug reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things that folks are working on in the community. Uh, take some time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is status updates. This is an opportunity to sync up on uh, what we've been working on. So you can uh, write out a few uh, things into the notes doc. You can mention what you have worked on since the previous meeting and what you plan to work on since the next meeting. Uh, this is also a good place for folks to give tips and tricks uh, if you happen to know about something that somebody is working on. Uh, but if the discussions do start getting too long, then we can always move things uh, to the fifth and final part, which is in the weeds. Uh, and in the weeds is an opportunity for long form discussions. These can come out of status updates or they can be identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. Uh, so that covers how the meeting will go. So next up to get us kicked off, we will start with community news. I'll take a timestamp here. And the first item in community news this week is the latest Python developer survey results have been published. Uh, the Python Software Foundation announced the results of their fifth official annual Python developers survey. The work is done each year as a collaborative effort between the Python Software Foundation and JetBrains. Uh, late last year, more than 23,000 Python developers and enthusiasts from almost 200 countries and regions participated in the survey to reveal the current state of the language and the ecosystem around it. Uh, so there is a link here to PyFound uh, blog uh, where you can read more about the survey results. Uh, let's see, next up here we have uh, Python 3.11 is up to 10 to 60% faster than Python 3.10. Uh, so Python 3.11.0 has reached beta 1 status uh, and it's close to release. Uh, it is up to 10 to 60% faster than Python 3.10, the previous version. Uh, on average, developers measured a 1.25 speed up increase uh, on the standard benchmark suite. Um, how's this being done? Python 3.11 is the first release to benefit from a project called Faster C Python. Uh, where CPython is the standard version of the Python interpreter. Faster CPython is a project funded by Microsoft, whose members include Python inventor uh, Guido Van Rossum. Um, and there is a link here to Analytics Insight uh, to learn more about those speedups coming in Python 3.11. 
Uh, next up here, uh, we have Life as a Python Software Foundation Director. Uh, so this is a YouTube video, uh, and it's a window into what it takes to lead the foundation responsible for guiding Python. Uh, so check out this video on YouTube with uh, some of the current and former, uh, I believe, Python Software Foundation directors. Uh, next up, uh, Google, uh, Google's plan to make chip development more like open source software. The Google Ooh. Hardware Toolchains team is launching a new developer portal, developers.google.com slash silicone, uh, to help the developer community get started with its open MPW shuttle program. This will allow anyone to submit open source integrated circuit designs to get manufactured at no cost. And there are links here to a Google blog as well as Slashdot if you want to learn more about that. Uh, Lord knows we could always use more open source designs for just about anything. So that was pretty exciting to see. Uh, next up, we have a Make uh, MakeZine board review. This is a board review of the Adafruit Feather RP2040. If you're interested in uh, MakeZine's uh, take on that board and learning all things about it, you can go and read that post over in MakeZine. Uh, and then the last one I have here is a project highlight for the week. And this is a macro pad mod. Um, this project is a little 3D printed stand with a macro pad. Uh, it looks like they modified the display to be um, set up at an angle, uh, so it kind of faces back towards you instead of flat. They also added a couple of extra rotary encoders as well as a 14 segment display, um, uh, you know, four of those 14 segment displays up above the, uh, the matrix, um, excuse me, the macro pad there. Uh, so it's all in a 3D printed case made out of TPU, and it runs CircuitPython. And the link here is to Reddit uh, Mechanical Keyboards subreddit. So I thought that was a super neat project that featured CircuitPython uh, that will be in the newsletter this week. Uh, and speaking of the newsletter this week, uh, the CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter that's emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com. There is a link in the notes if you want to follow that. Uh, it highlights the latest Python on hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, uh, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or projects, uh, edit next week's draft on GitHub. There is a link for that in the notes doc as well. Uh, you can submit a pull request uh, with the changes. You can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email to cpnews at adafruit.com. Uh, let's see. So that gets us to the end of the newsletter update for the week. So let's do a timestamp here. And next up, we will look at the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Uh, so first up, we'll take a look overall, and I'll read this section. So overall, across the whole project, we had 35 pull requests merged uh, from 18 authors. A couple of names that I don't recognize here. Um, so these folks may be newer, at least, to the project. Uh, and actually, I noticed I missed one here, but uh, Sim Allier uh, is the first one. Um, Lisa Apple, or Liz Apple. Uh, Nathan Y3G. Uh, DJ... Air Jr., I think this is, uh, Bab Lock B, uh, AJS256, and Simon Vale. Uh, those were a couple of users, again, that I didn't recognize as being regular contributors, um, and that was across all of uh, the CircuitPython libraries and other related projects. So thanks to all of those folks, as well as all of our other more regular contributors. Um, we also had six reviewers this week, so thank you, uh, as always, to all of our reviewers. And um, we had 21 issues closed uh, by 11 people and 13 issues opened by 9 people. So we're net down uh, about 8 issues, it looks like, this week across everything. Um, so that's great to see, moving in the right direction. Um, and that is it for overall. So I will take a timestamp and send it over to Scott. Uh, do you want to tell us about the core? Sure. Um, I managed to get undistracted from the Apple announcements. Um, so for the stats for the core, uh, 11 pull requests merged from 12 different authors. So thank you to all of our authors. I won't highlight the new folks since, uh, Tim just did that. We also had three reviewers, uh, Lady Ada, Dan, and myself. Uh, we have 15 open pull requests. Again, we, we do have like this long tail of pull requests that are getting a bit old. 
So uh, if you're involved at any of these, please take a look and just see where they're at. Um, I'll try to do that today as well. Um, we've got three that are over 100 days old and then a few that are kind of in the 30 to 90 days old range as well. Uh, issues wise, we had six closed issues by five people and four open by four people. So we're net down as well, which is good uh, for a total of 512 open issues. We generally gauge how urgent issues are by the milestone that we've assigned to them. And this impacts the prioritization of those of us who work on CircuitPython uh, for Adafruit. Uh, we have two open issues on 7.3x. We have 43 on 8.0. Um, we, I think we intend on triaging the 8.0 ones as well, but we haven't done that yet. Um, again, we have negative two issues not assigned to milestones, so I'm not exactly sure why that is. But uh, we'll take a look and... Uh, not assigned a milestone is a great way for us to know what we have to triage when we go forward. So um, that's it for the core. All right. Thanks, Scott. Um, next mm -hmm. up, we will pass it over to Katni. Do you want to tell us about the libraries this week? Sure. So this section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras, such as the community bundle and our cookie cutter. Across all of those repositories, we had 16 pull requests merged from six different authors and five different reviewers. Uh, two, one of those was uh, a month old, which is good to see that we're still picking up some older PRs, uh, and the rest were 12 days um, or more recent. So we're still keeping up with new ones as well. That leaves us with 22 open pull requests. We had 11 issues closed by eight people and nine open by six people, leaving us with 640 open issues. 185 of those are good first issues. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, uh, including the open pull requests and open issues. If you're interested in reviewing, look at the open pull requests, take a look, leave a comment, let us know uh, what you saw. If you have the hardware, test it. Uh, all of that is super helpful. And once you're comfortable with that, we can talk about leveling you up to our review team. If you're interested in contributing to code or documentation, check out the open issues. If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. We also have a guide on contributing to Git and GitHub. Uh, I'm sorry, contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. And we're always available on Discord to help out. Uh, if you're looking for something a little more complicated, check out Bug or Enhancement. Um, but you can search that open issues. Uh, page and see if anything strikes your fancy and leave a comment that you're working on it and um, again we are always available to help uh, in terms of library updates in the last seven days there were no new libraries but there is a list of updated libraries in the notes doc that i uh, will not read off but you are welcome to check out if you're interested and that's what i've got all right thanks Katni. Uh, next up we will send it over to Mako melissa to tell us about blinka for the week Hello, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for a MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And uh, this week we had eight pull requests merged by four authors and four reviewers. Uh, there are currently four open pull requests amongst all the different repositories, and there were four closed issues by one person and zero open by zero people, leaving a net of 75 open issues. Uh, there were 8,788 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month, and we are now up to 89 boards. And that's it. Right, awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, so that concludes the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Next up, we will go to the first of our two round robin sections, the Hug Reports. Uh, so Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. As mentioned, this section is held as a round robin where I will start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically, um, giving everyone a chance to participate. Uh, if you're text only or missing the meeting but have Hug Reports in the notes document, then I'll read them off as we get to you in the list. Uh, so my Hug Reports for this week, uh, thank you to Scott for reviewing my PR for tile grid contains uh, inside the core as well as sharing uh, some ideas around group uh, interactivity as well, uh, sort of tangentially related to the tile grid stuff. Um, thank you to C. Grover uh, for testing out many devices with a custom build of CircuitPython that changed the 
uh, brightness PWM frequency in the built-in display uh, and leaving notes and detailed info and diagrams and things about uh, how each one of them behaved. Uh, definitely appreciate Seagrover's work on that. Thank you to Maker Melissa for reviewing some of my recent PRs across a couple of different libraries and other utilities. Uh, and then a group hug for everybody. Um, and then next up, we have C. Grover. Uh, let's see, you text only C. Grover? Yeah, I th think so. Uh, if you are here and wanna read your uh, status updates, let me know. Um, and then um, I'll call you back up uh, if you have status updates. But C. Grover has a, uh, group hug this week for everybody. Yeah, text only. Okay, perfect. Uh, and then next up, we will uh, send it over to Dan. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks to Scott, who um, redid how translations were compiled and saved a whole bunch of space on the ESP32 boards, and uh, that was great. Thanks to D. Sarabian, who's helping me debug an ESP32 SPI problem. They have a sample program that clearly causes a problem, and I've been using that as a test case, and we've been iterating on that. It's been really helpful. And thanks to you, uh, Foamy Guy, for a big PR to add a PWM frequency argument to display initialization, which required changing a lot of calls. Thanks a lot. Okay. For sure. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is G3 Holiday, who's lurking, so I'll read theirs. They have a group hug and a hug for Scott for tile grid work. Uh, so again, that was G3 Holiday. And next up is Katni. Thanks, Tim. So first up, I have a hug report for Mark Gambler for helping me out over the weekend with trying to get some code going on a personal project. To Jerry for writing the code and helping me along the way with hardware and so on to Dan for jumping into the project thread to attempt to help me with code issue that involved pin alarm and deep sleep, and to Tectric for helping me with figuring out a simple MicroPython thing that I was struggling to find an example of, and a group hug. All right, thanks, Katni. Next up is Maker Melissa. Uh, hello, I wanted to give a hug to Similar for adding a new board to Blinka to get a user tenue at, uh, for fixing the spy port setting for the Raspberry Pi on Blinka and a group pack to everyone else. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, next up is Mark Gambler, who is lurking. Let's get a timestamp in. There we go. And then I'll read them. Uh, so Mark Gambler has hug reports for Tanute, Scott, and Anik Data for uh, PR reviews this week. So thanks again from Mark Gambler there. Uh, next up is Tammy Makes Things. Whoops. I'm stamping the wrong spot. Here we go. All right, there we go. Now Tammy Makes Things, if you want to go. Sure. Hi, everybody. I just have a group hug for the whole community for being awesome. All right. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, just a quick hug report for you, Tim. Uh, for keeping the deep dives going, I was able to watch part of it on Friday, and it was nice to kind of hang out. So thanks for keeping those going. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. My pleasure, definitely. Uh, next up is Tectric, who is text only. So I will read theirs. Uh, Tectric, te excuse me, excuse me. Tectric says a hug re report for Neurodoc uh, for help understanding a cookie cutter issue and then a group hug. So thank uh, you, Tectric, for entering those hug reports in for the week. Um, and that is the end of Hug Reports. So next up, we will go to Status Updates. Let's get a timestamp. Uh, status Updates is our time to sync up on what we're doing. This section is also held as a round robin where I will start and then we'll go through the list alphabetically, uh, giving everyone a chance to participate. When I call on you, go ahead and take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you plan on uh, doing up until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide those tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion does become too long uh, for status updates, then we can always move it to in the weeds uh, down towards the end of the meeting. Uh, so I will start with status updates. Let's get a timestamp. Um, so this was a bit of a light week for me. I did take uh, Monday, the holiday off last week, so I definitely did less this week, but I'm getting back into things um now today but over the last week a couple of things that i did do were 
uh, update devices uh, in the core. Uh, all the devices with a built-in display um, updated them all the initializations to use a new constructor argument for the PWM frequency. Um, and so that got added internally in all those board definitions. And that new argument is helpful uh, for, in particular, the PyPortal Titano because it had a slightly different um, driver chip or something for the display. And so it's, it's uh, PWM needed to work differently in order to have full range of brightness. Um, and so we added that argument and then updated all the boards to use it. Um, I did also make a couple of tweaks to circuitpython.org, uh, which is always fun to get back into developing kind of a different type of thing. It's uh, not, not really Python, but more uh, you know HTML and JavaScript templating type projects. So it was fun to uh, play around in that world a bit. I added a new note uh, to the Pico system, Pimeroni Pico system device to say how to get to the bootloader. Um, and then I also uh, made it so the downloads page will automatically autofocus the search box. So if you click over to the downloads page, you can then just start typing um, and it will be narrowing the boards down for you, which is a nice usability improvement, I think. A um, couple of things I have um, planned to work on this week. Um, trying out the, uh, well, actually, no, this was still, I did work on this uh, over the weekend on a stream. So. Uh, playing around with the tile grid contains function. That's a, a PR that I have in the core. And in order to test it out, I created a, a slide puzzle application. So like old school little kids toy, you know, four by four slide puzzle type thing. Uh, we made one of those using tile grid. Uh, and then for this week, the thing I have planned so far is um, making a easy, very, very basic, simple text scroller for the matrix portal. There's a couple of different projects out there that scroll various things. Uh, but I wanted one that uses no network, no additional setup, minimal libraries, and just reads the text from a text file and scrolls it. That way it's like uh, dead simple for anyone and everyone to set up, even if they have basically no um, you know, programming or computer proficiency uh, really beyond just opening the text file. So um, that's one thing I'll be working on this week. Um, next up for status updates is uh, C. Grover, who is text only, so I'll read them. Uh, and then uh, Dan, you'll be after C. Grover here. So uh, C. Grover's updates. Um, this week uh, submitted a PR to add a global NeoPixel brightness getter and setter to the NeoTrellis slash MultiTrellis library. Uh, this PR was approved yesterday and is waiting for an independent test. Um, next up, uh, C. Grover is still working on the DisplayIO based brightness algorithm for the matrix portal and other RGB matrix displays. The prototype code is working nicely, but needs to have the controlled DisplayIO objects and palettes defined in advance. The continuing challenge is to figure out how to make the algorithm autonomously discover and control all DisplayIO objects. Um, and then last uh, entry from Seagrover this week says, display brightness is my life now. Um, all right, so next up, we will send it over to Dan. Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, so first, I, uh, we have a number of minor CircuitPython 8 changes to the API of, for CircuitPython native modules for CircuitPython 8. One of them is to move one wire out of bus IO to one wire I.O. We did it. We moved it into one wire I.O. and left it in bus I.O. for seven. And now we're moving it out. So that required circuit Python changes, Blinka changes, and uh, uh, one minor library change. So that's done. Um, I reviewed Scott's um, build space saving PR, which I mentioned earlier, uh, to keep an eye on making sure that, that it, it didn't, it was still, um, not using up too much build time when we ran a, a continuous integration run, and that worked out well, and we have got to say more about that. Um, I added and tested a board definition for the latest Feather ESP32 S3. This is the one with four megabyte flash and two megabyte PS RAM. That's available um, in absolute newest in the S3 um, buckets and we will, it will be in the next in the first alpha release for 800. I'm debugging problems with ESP32 SPI. I've been working with someone as I mentioned uh, to come up with a reproducible test case for problems that occur when you use display IO specifically on the matrix portal with the ESP32 SPI and uh, I'm now I have a test case now I have to debug it. 
And I'll probably go ahead and make a, an 800 Alpha 1 release soon since we have some new boards and other things and we may as well uh, have a placeholder Alpha 1. And it makes it easier to do the next release after that because there's not such a backlog. Okay. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up, Katni, do you have going on this week? Thanks, Tim. This, let's see, last week I did the final testing on Pylip and greenlit it for release. So uh, we've been doing a ton of testing over the past, geez, month and a half, two months now, um, to get uh, from 1.0 to 2.0, and 2.0 is now live. I took a series of uh, videos and converted them to GIFs of double tapping reset to get into the bootloader on different boards. Uh, this is for the whippersnapper application. I think it's for documentation for it. Um, apparently, one of the biggest support issues with things like this is um, folks not understanding the rhythm of getting into the bootloader. Um, so instead of just trying to explain it in words, uh, they wanted to actually include um, GIFs for each board. So I got a bunch of those and continued on the Cutie Pie ESP32 Pico guide. So this week, I'm going to finish that guide now that I have hardware. I have MicroPython NeoPixel Blink going. Um, so that's a start. That one took um, some iteration to get it working. Um, and then next up, I'm going to be doing a GitHub Fancy Profile Guide. Um, got a little more clarity on what the idea is for that. Basically, um, if you wanted to join an open source community or introduce yourself, you know, in, in the process of joining an open source community, what would you want to show about yourself on, on GitHub? GitHub has a thing where you can make a repository that is just your name, your user ID, and you can add a readme to it. And then you can use Markdown um, in many, many ways to create a profile. Um, so the plan is to update my own profile um, and go through the process, um, explain a bit about Markdown, uh, talk about what types of things make sense to include. Um, obviously, that's different for everybody, but um, I will be doing this guide uh, from my point of view. So I will go through the things that I would want to add. Um, there was a repository that's full of uh, tools to improve your uh, GitHub profile. And so initially it was a little overwhelming and very unclear what the guide was supposed to be, but uh, I talked to Phil about it today and it's uh, much clearer. And then following that, I will be doing um, a guide with a tower light that uh, is a GitHub Actions data light. Um, using the GitHub API and obviously desktop Python because it is a the tower light plugs into your computer via USB and then talks over serial. There's no microcontrollers involved. Um, and that is what's on my list for this week. And then the past over this past weekend, uh, I worked on the mailbox project finally. Um, I still need to get the Raspberry Pi set up, which I do so rarely. It's always a huge pain when I need to do it. Um, Everything is soldered and assembled, but there's something up with the code. It's not working properly. I need to do a bit of more testing um, with some guidance, but it might be a bug. And uh, with uh, pin alarm and deep sleep. And then I managed to solder a chunky LED onto the Pylora bonnet with some creative use of mounting holes and unconventional wiring. I have no idea yet if it works, but it looks really nice from the top. Um, if it does work, I will use this bonnet in the final project uh, instead of trying to do it again, because I don't know if I can replicate it. That's what I got going on. All right. Thanks, Kenny. Um, next up, let's get a timestamp here. And uh, Maker Melissa. Hello. So last week I added um, some issue tags to the circuitpython.org open issues under contributing. Um, I fixed uh, various e-ink issues and added some new features. Um, I added, or I updated the PyTFT installer script 
with some options to allow it to work in Ubuntu better, like uh, being able to pass in your boot folder, which is a little different than on the uh, Raspberry Pi OS. I went through guide feedback for programming an Arduino using Raspberry Pi GPIO guide. I started with, uh, I started looking into getting the TSC touchscreen breakout to work with the kernel drivers, and I also organized and closed a bunch of Blinka issues. This week, I'm going to continue looking at the touchscreen stuff and possibly look at some of the HT16K33 library issues. And that's it. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, next up is Tammy Makes Things. Thanks. So um, last week, I finally am starting to dig out of the backlog with my new job and promotion. Um, so I have a little bit more breathing room to work on other stuff. I did one Twitch stream um, this past Sunday working on the display I.O. part of my uh, card deck library and demonstrating in real time that I cannot do geometry without drawing things out on graph paper. Um, but that's okay. Tried to do a second stream earlier in the week, but was foiled by repeated Cox internet outages in my neighborhood. There's been six of them in the last two weeks, and it's driving me bananas. Um, so hopefully that stops. And this week, I'm hopefully getting back to a more regular streaming schedule, still working on the Display I.O. card deck library, and I'm building some debugging helpers for um, sprite sheets and tile grids because I keep getting the X and Y coordinates and some other things reversed in my head when I'm figuring them out. And so I'm trying to build some debugging helpers to help me keep them straight. And I will probably share those at least in a GitHub gist or something for other people. And I'm hoping to do some PR reviews and maybe some more type of annotation stuff this week if I get some time. So that's what I got. Thanks. Nice. That sounds awesome. Thanks, Tammy. Um, next up, we have Scott. Hello. So um, not a ton, because this translation stuff uh, took some time. So uh, for those of you who know that I've been working on uh, code size optimization for translations on non-LTO builds. Um, basically, with LTO, we're able to remove a bunch of source strings and remove a bunch of code to decide which translation to return. Um, but when we were doing traditional compiles like we do on Espressif, uh, we were actually storing all the co code in all of the original strings. So it's, all, it's, it's like 30 or 40k. Um, there's a trick where we play where we can now inline it and let the each individual call site be optimized away. Um, that had some build time issues that Dan pointed out. Thanks again to Dan for looking at that. Um, and I realized what I could do is I could split the the translation data out of that giant code block that gets optimized away so that we only optimize it the once and then link to different uh, translations at, at the end. So that was good and that gets gets us pretty comparable build times and but we still save the space. Um, so that was just merged in today. Thanks to Dan. That was a lot of like running down build problems. Um, and change some LTO stuff as well. LTO make file stuff there as well. Um, so I'm now back to working on the Wi-Fi auto join stuff. Um, and I think the kind of first iteration of the status bar on the serial terminal will also be part of this work. Um, and then I'm going to talk with Brent uh, about their approach with Whip or Snapper as well, because you still have this problem of like the very first time you get a device, how do you get it on uh, your network? So that is something I think Brent and the Whipper Snapper folks have thought a lot about. And so uh, I think we're hoping to replicate that. Um, the other thing is they've done some status LED work. So maybe we'll kind of bridge that and be able to do status LED work or in the same way that they do. Although I have a feeling they took what we did in CircuitPython for code.py execution and now use it for Wi-Fi. So i uh, going to talk with Brent later about that. Um, but it should be pretty neat, and it's a first, another step towards web workflow stuff. Um, hopefully you can't hear the baby too bad. And then um, just a note for what I was doing in my personal time, I've gotten a little bit interested in redistricting Seattle City Council districts, 
and I made a, a quick site over the weekend that is a way for you to uh, draw on a map and just share a link to people and they can see what you drew in the map. So mapnote.dev, just a single indexed HTML. Um, but they were having this problem where like people who are giving feedback to the redistricting folks can't just say like, this is the area that I care about. <laughs> so I, I put this together uh, over the weekend as a hopefully a tool that they'll be able to do of just sharing uh, polygons and stuff. So that's it for me. I'm excited to do uh, get back to the web workflow stuff. Um, yeah, it should be neat. Nice. Got lots of interesting stuff going on as always. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, next up and last for our status updates is Tectric, uh, who's text only, so I'll read his. Uh, last week, Tectric. Um, Last week, uh, worked on finalizing, uh, getting the Adafruit logging 4.0.0 deployed, uh, flagged libraries with potential problems due to the logging module upgrade, spent time uh, with my girlfriend and her parents, so a light week, um, and then this week for Tectric, uh, working on address library and learn, uh, let's see, I think probably working to address library and learn example repo changes resulting from the new logging uh, update. Um, applying manual patches for the Pylant IC uh, upgrade from a few weeks ago. And uh, lastly, Tectric says some more uh, debugging on the Bluefruit Connect image transfer feature addition. So that's the ability to send images. Um, I, th I don't know if it's to or from, but uh, like between a smartphone and a uh, Bluefruit capable device like Circuit Playground Bluefruit. Um, all right, and that wraps us up for status updates. So I will take a timestamp and then talk about in the weeds. So uh, the final section of our meeting here is uh, the in the weeds section. This is an opportunity for more long form discussion that either comes out of status updates or that folks have identified ahead of time. Um, if you have an in the weeds topic, uh, please make sure to add it down at the bottom of our notes doc. Uh, we have one in here now, so we'll get into that. But if you know of another one that you want to discuss, uh, please do go ahead and add it there. That way we can just move on when the time is ready. Um, so this week we have uh, in the weeds from Tectric. Uh, Tectric, you were text only. Uh, so I will read this out um, unless you let me know otherwise. Um, let me get here. Okay, so uh, Tectric says in the weeds, um, go for it. Okay, yep. Um, Adafruit logging. So this is the uh, library, Adafruit logging library. Um, this library has recently uh, become a strict subset of the C Python logging module. Um, the differences between the two have been hidden under the hood. One such difference is that a handler takes a message and log levels directly instead of a log record object. Um, so if I understand correctly, it's been a few days since I've looked into this, so I may, be, um, I may have it backwards or incorrect, but from, from my recollection, I think the CPython one uh, takes a log record, but our CircuitPython one takes um, the message and the log level instead of that object, that log record object. Um, so those uh, methods have been made private in the circuit Python one. Um, that way we won't have, um, you know, functions that have different signatures. Um, one learn guide example and potential use case is that uh, people are wanting to create their own handlers uh, for the loggers and they need to define those methods. Um, and there's a link here, which I will copy and drop into the chat here. Um, so I think the high level idea, which I'll read the rest of this here, but if I understand, it's basically weighing the um, subset of CPython against the uh, functionality of us being able to make the custom handlers. Um, so Tectric also added here uh, pros of the current uh, way that it's done. There's not a lot of overhead. Uh, for what the typical use case would be, uh, logging to sys.stdair or possibly an external file, so it's lightweight and simple to understand. Um, cons of the way that it's currently done is we can't easily define custom handlers, um, and those handlers methods uh, would take different arguments than their CPython equivalents. Um, if we did want those to be equalized, then we would need to implement uh, log record um, but we could use a more inexpensive solution like named tuple uh, instead of, 
I guess, creating the full log record um, object, if I'm understanding that. Um, so the kind of the root of the question is, is it worth exposing methods of handler to allow for customization? So is it worth exposing those me uh, methods, um, even though they would then differ from the C Python module, or do we want to not expose them uh, at the cost of making it more difficult to customize, uh, like well, specifically to create a custom handler? So if you wanted to create a handler that you know, I don't know, sent your logs across the network or something different that's not happening in uh, any of the existing ones. Um, I think that's my understanding of it. I would say I, I don't have a lot of experience with the, the logging library or loggers in general. I think I would probably lean towards um, the same thing which we generally lean towards is trying to make it match the CPython one. So I think I would lean towards the subset uh, at the cost of it being a little bit more difficult to customize. Um, but again, I don't have a lot of experience, so I also may not be the best judge of, of that trade-off, truthfully. Um, anybody else have thoughts or ideas on uh, this issue? In the I kind of I, I agree with you. I mean, I've, I've been doing Python a long time, and I still don't use the logging library. Yeah, prints, prints are um, pretty helpful. I've never found a to level up all the way yeah i've just not like i think in the server world where you're dealing with like lots of libraries and stuff it makes sense but uh like we had something similar when i was at google but i do a lot of smaller python stuff i think that i think it's fine to just have the subset of the api and then the private versions of those things that should take log records but don't like python doesn't care if they're private right like <laughs> yeah and then there's non-standard names, and so if you really need to reach into the the object, you're kind of accepting the risk. Um, so yeah, I would say the public API should be the same C Python. I mean, this is a little weird that we have a guide about it. Um, maybe because we have a guide, we should do it the proper way. I also think that it's probably not. It's probably not the the end of the world to do a log record object like the strings an object anyway log records probably pretty small like if you needed to do log record you'd be okay too okay um like logging is not fast either way yeah so i don't think it's really a performance problem and maker melissa points out in the chat there uh, it could be done like mini mqtt library and it's done with callbacks, I guess, in that library. I'm not super familiar with it either, either. Uh, but that's yeah. maybe something to consider as well. I think Melissa probably has more experience than you or I in terms of logging with regular Python. Yeah. So. Uh, OK. Uh, I think you, under the, under cans, uh, you understand the constraints, so um, you, you've got it. All right. Uh, Tectric, does that Kind of give you a point in the right direction. I think we lean towards the um, here, so keep it as is. And if people want to customize, then they can dig into the code and figure out. Uh, yeah, that is my that is my understanding as well, Tectric. Yep. You and well, I if you have to, if you have to update the custom logger guide, to it should probably match C Python. Like if we have a learn guide for it, you should probably not use a private API. Oh, in the learn guide, private API in the learn guide. I gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what all is in the learn guide? Okay. So yeah, I, I I just saw the the example code. I didn't look at what the text around it was, but. So then, uh, log record. It sounds like is probably best uh, to keep. Yeah. To keep that learn guide code matching a C Python if we can. Right, but if we have higher level functions that that use those internal versions that don't create the object then just that. I don't know. I, I haven't looked at it enough. But generally, I think we should we should consider APIs that are in learn guides as public APIs that we want to do properly and, and because we're going to support it and there's going to be a lot of example code for it. OK. Um, so if it's something that it's in a learn guide, we should probably not teach them to do it the, the sneaky way. Let's see the learn guide might. Might not. Yeah, and then it will be C Python compatible, which will be. Yeah. Don't worry about the object creation. 
It's all might, logging slow. Might have to change a bit if I can. Um, yeah, and uh, so Tectric, when it does come time to, if there are changes to make in the learn guide, when it does come time to do that, um, I can help you out with that as well. I have access to update stuff and learn. So if you need somebody to help change a page, I can, I can help you with that when the time comes as well. Um, and that is our only topic for In the Weeds this week. Um, so let's wrap it up. Let me timestamp in there for the wrap up. Uh, so this has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting uh, again for June 6th, uh, 2022 is today's date. Thank you everyone who participated. Uh, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, as well as those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. Uh, the video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be made available on major podcast services. Um, uh, it will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, uh, which comes out tomorrow, so head over to adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that. Um, the next meeting will be held on Monday as usual at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Yeah, 11 a.m. Pacific, and that is going to be on June the 13th. Um, uh, this meeting will be held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. Uh, and to be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. Um, so that's all for today. Thank you again to everyone, and we hope to see you all next week. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.